Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Patrick from the Poison Pen, and we're here today with another of our virtual events. And today uh, we have Laura Jo Rowland, who's here to discuss her new book in the Victorian mystery series, A Portrait of Peril. And we were just going down memory lane about uh, the early books, Shinju and Bundori. And I think uh, Laura was here back in 1994. Um, so it's been a few years. Um, and then Karen Auden, stepped in to uh to do uh, the interviewing duties and she this is her latest book a trace of deceit and we i should say we have signed copies of both books in the store and um if you're watching on facebook i will be monitoring the uh, comments in the facebook feed so if you have questions for laura or karen just go ahead and send them in and i'll pop up about halfway through and and uh and pitch them to the authors and then meanwhile barbara peters is at her home office there, and uh, she's going to be taking over. So, Barbara, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Patrick. It is my home office. Actually, it's an old picture of my home library, but <laughs> my home office being a wreck. But I, I like this picture, so I may stick with it for a while. Laura Jo, it's just wonderful to see you again. I can hardly believe it's really been 25 years. Good Lord. Yeah, it really has been a long time, but I'm thrilled to be back in uh, some way, shape, or form. Well, we are too. And you know, I absolutely loved your your first series set in medieval Japan, well, Shogunate Japan. Um, and if I remember right, because I'm still seeing the covers in my mind, they were published in the UK, weren't they, by headline? Um, yes, and in, in the UK and the United States, and um, I think it might have been 14 other countries. I, I don't remember exactly. But they had, the, the, I have the English copies because mm -hmm. I collected them because I was so taken with them. And I know how beautiful the covers were, which always leads me down, you know, the rabbit hole of why are British covers so different than American book covers. But yeah, well, if you ever figure it out, let me know because I don't know either. <laughs> no, but they were great. So let's, how many books did you write in uh, for those characters? It was a lot. Yeah, it was uh, 18 and it was, um, I guess, almost one a year for about 20 years. Indeed it was. And you started out with your protagonist, whose name is, bl I'm blanking out, remind me? Sano Ichiro. Thank you, Sano Ichiro. And he was in a really perilous position um, because he had to walk a line in the complicated politics that were going on at the time. And then you brought him forward and you gave him a family, you gave him a wife, you gave him children. He had a constant enemy in the era of the Shogun. And that went back and forth for ages. And somehow Sana would always get just to the edge of disaster. And then somehow either events or people would save him. But he was a person of real integrity. Um, so how did you, why did you decide to write that particular series? What in your life brought you to medieval Japan? Well, I think the short answer is always, I watched too many samurai movies in college and I really got taken with that culture and that world. And um, actually there's very little that you can see in the, the movies because they take place during the civil war period. So everybody's busy fighting and killing each other. So a lot of the elements of the culture don't really show up. But when I started digging, you know, it was, it was a really fascinating world and I thought, well, if, if there were ever a unique detective, this is the world that he would come out of. I thought you did a wonderful job. For anybody who ever read Shogun, uh, I recommend Laura Joe's books, which you may have to find in used copies at the moment. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but we've been to Japan a couple of times and actually toured some of the castles and, you know, been to Shikoku where the, um, the, male and female bridges were, where, you know, people being persecuted by the shoguns would leap up into the mountains and pull their bridges up behind them. And then you also wrote about Hokkaido and the, and the Ainu people, the indigenous people of Japan, uh, which was very informative and which I knew nothing about. Yeah, I, I didn't know anything about them either, except I, I knew that um, Japan had a native people and um, that's actually my, my post-Hurricane Katrina book. Um, after Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, where I was living at the time, I evacuated up to Michigan, up north. And I thought, well, 
Sano is going to go up north too. <laughs> so he ended up in, um, in Hokkaido, the, uh, the Ainu territory, and he had a, a whole big adventure with uh, supernatural elements all the way up in, in snow country with um, a people that um, back then the, uh, the I guess the, the reigning class of Japanese had very little contact with at the time. It cracks me up to think about them today, you know, with their fabulous restaurants and the bullet train from Tokyo and world-class ski resorts. And I think they've also become um, an enormous garden center or purveyor of, uh, you know, flowers, sort of like the Dutch only in Asia. So it's fun to read about them in your books and then think about them today. But I digress. We're here to really talk about Victorian mystery with Karen Auden, who's um, knows much more about Victorian mystery than I will ever know. So Laura, what, let's talk just a little bit about um, the books leading up to the current book, because is this book six in your Victorian series or five? Yeah, it's, it's five, number five. Okay, so for those who haven't read the first four books, why don't you introduce your characters for a moment, and then Karen can take over the program and fill us in on the new book. Okay, well, um, my series is set in um, late Victorian England, and my character is a photographer named Sarah Bain, who starts out as an independent photographer with a, a studio that she's running on a shoestring, always on the brink of bankruptcy. And um, her first episode is called uh, The Ripper's Shadow. So um, if you want to start a series off with a bang, give your character a really difficult case to solve. So I, I gave Sarah Jack the Ripper. So um, along the way, um, she acquires um, some friends, just like Sano acquired a whole family and a bunch of sidekicks along the way. Um, Sarah had to do it fast in the first novel. She acquires a, a gay nobleman and a 14-year-old street urchin, and, and together they track down Jack the Ripper in their first episode. So then um, after that, she becomes by some strange quirks of fate, a, a newspaper crime scene photographer for a um, very rich man who is starting his newspaper empire. I guess you might call him a, a, a William Hurst um, wannabe or a, a Rupert Murdoch wannabe. And he runs like the, the dirtiest kind of tabloid um, sort of similar to what goes on in Britain today. So he hires Sarah and her friends to be crime scene photographers. And that's where they get most of their new cases and how they have most of their subsequent adventures. Well, I like the fact that you've created a family with an unconventional family for her. Um, and, you know, in a way, this has got some feminist, well, not in a way, it does have some feminist issues about a woman trying to make a living at a time when not too many women were able to. And, um, you know, her standing up for, in a way, gay rights, um, even if it all had to be. People forget, you know, it's it that people, you, you could be jailed or back and Sharon K. Penman's time, I was thinking about her earlier today, you could actually die for, for being gay and being caught at it, so to speak. So I think you do some really fascinating issues, which Karen will be talking to you about. But I was thinking, when I was in England back in the 80s, I think it was, I hope I have this right, I went to Laycock Abbey, which is one of the very first places that photographs were taken. Do I have the right place? Karen, do you know? It was I don't know. I think it was an exposure in a window, like like you know when Henry VIII knocked out the monasteries or the, the clergy. A lot mm -hmm. of of English, either nobility or rising middle class or whatever it is, took over these buildings and um, created country homes out of them. And Laycock Abbey had a particularly, I hope it's Laycock, had a particularly good set of windows. And by accident, somebody left something so that the light came through the window and exposed something. And, you know, it's one of those early photography stories. I should go away and chat. I don't know why I brought it up when I really don't remember exactly what I'm talking about, but it made a real impression on me because, you know, we take photography and now with our phones and everything so much for granted. And it really wasn't that long ago that, that this happened, you know. Um, the Victorians did a remarkable number of scientific and manufacturing, engineering, technological achievements that, you know, just kind of like all at once from an agrarian economy to really the 
industrial revolution in, in this small country. And I think all the aspects of it are fascinating. So Karen, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to fade away here and let you and Laura have a great conversation. And I'm going to be listening. So thank you so Thanks, much. Barbara. Okay, thank you, Barbara. There we go. Um, so I'm, I'm so glad to I'm so glad to be able to talk to you. Um, yeah, this I'm so is glad that we can visit. Um, so my books are set in 1870s. So I'm just a tiny shade kind of before before this book starting in, so in 1890. Um, I think my first question has to be, how did you make the leap from Japan to the Victorian era? Do you see any themes that are connecting your first series and your second series or what, what inspired you to make the jump? Yeah, well, I guess I went from uh, too many samurai movies to too much masterpiece theater. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I've always I've always been a historical mystery buff and and always a, an English crime fish, fiction buff, and so mm -hmm. it seemed like in some ways the transition was natural. Um, I guess I, I do have to keep certain things in mind, the, the cultural differences, like uh, Barbara mentioned that uh, being gay was against the law in a lot of places. And I, I have to keep remembering that in Victorian England, it was, and in medieval Japan, it was not. Um, you could go around and be as gay as you wanted in um, medieval Japan, and it was just not a pro problem. The, the shogun was reportedly gay. And if he could do it, well, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I did. I had no idea. I didn't know that. I remember the um, oh, what was the what was the play? Gross Indecency, which yeah. was the play about Oscar Wilde, um, who was accused oh, yeah. of buggery and then thrown in jail. Um, I saw it. I think maybe twenty five years ago in New York, Liam Neeson played Oscar Wilde. It's oh. a one man show. <laughs> it's it's ama It was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, we we tend to think of these things as sort of historically evolving. Um, and they they aren't never they aren't necessarily evolving in one direction. They may evolve in one direction in one way, and then they swing backwards and sort of a more of a pendulum swing. So you also jumped from a male protagonist to a female one. What kinds of changes did you have to make in that direction? Well, I guess the the reason I chose a male protagonist the first time around was because women's lives were so limited back mm -hmm. in the the seventeenth century. And you just couldn't have a woman going around doing all the things you need to do to, to solve a crime. Mm -hmm. So I have Sano getting married and having his wife solve cases, but you know, she solves one particular aspect of the crime and he does really most of the, the legwork because you know women's freedom was so circumscribed. So I, I really needed a male protagonist then. Otherwise, I would have ended up with a detective who uh, couldn't go anywhere and talk to half the population. Yep. Yeah. So, um, you know, things, things opened up a lot more in the Victorian era. You know, women mm -hmm. had a lot more freedom, even though we don't normally think of Victorian period as being a period of freedom for women. But, you know, compared mm -hmm. to medieval Japan, it really was. So that that was why why the switcheroo there, and uh, also I really wanted to write from a woman's point of view because I think it's fun. Mm -hmm. It is. My three novels they're um, they're interconnected. All of them take place in the eighteen seventies, but each one has a different female protagonist. So sort of you know take take um, that, but the world is the same, and so the secondary characters move from book to book. It's only the protagonist that changes, and. I too found that writing from, a, I mean, I, I appreciate writing from a woman's perspective just because I, I, I just prefer it. But um, the 1870s and 80s and also the 90s, I think saw some drastic changes in law with respect to women. For example, in 1870, there was a Married Woman's Property Act that for the first time allowed women who worked to keep their wages because under coverture, they had to hand everything over to their husband. A married woman was not a, a femme soul. She had to, everything she owned belonged to him, including the children. 
and her wages, anything she earned, anything she brought to the marriage became his as soon as they were married. Um, and all of a sudden now women could keep their wages. It was just a little crack in the iceberg. Um, but I think that, you know, and, and there was obviously a lot of agitation for things like um, curtailing women's working hours. They had been sort of unlimited. And I think the act was in 1874 that said women can work no more than 56 hours per week in a factory. Now that sounds ridiculous, but they had been working more. So, so women were beginning to get a little bit of protection, um, a little bit, a few rights. I mean, obviously it'd be another 50 years before they got the vote, but so they do have some wiggle room. Yeah, um, and I think that was also a period of a big social reform in general. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's as if the, uh, the authorities and the high society people suddenly opened their eyes and saw all the stuff that they didn't really think was right. Um, I don't yeah. know if it was conscience or they just said, well, we don't want to see that nasty stuff. Get rid of it. Like, uh, especially child labor. I mean, mm -hmm. talking about women working in the yeah. factories, there were children working in the factories along with them. Exactly. And children working down in the mines because they were small yeah. and they could crawl mm -hmm. inside the caves and things. Mm -hmm. So um, you really, really had some big, big changes there. Like, mm -hmm. it seems like this would have been obvious from our point of view that you, you really shouldn't have babies in the mines, but you know, back then you uh, had to yeah. wake up with that. Well, and the Children, um, the Education Act of 18, I think it was either 1870 or 1872, mandated that all children from six, age six till 12 had to be in school. And that was a huge one because of course that pulled the kids out of the mines and got them, you know, got them schooling. But we, you know, the fact that that was something that had to be legislated then was, you know, it's interesting. So, um, but you, I, I, I really appreciated that Sarah, you managed to find wiggle room for her um, without making her feel like a 21st century heroine, just kind of stuck in Victorian era. She felt Victorian, she had concerns that were Victorian, but you managed to find space for her um, to, to be a little bit unconventional. And one of the ways you do that is by putting her, you know, by having her be a photographer. So in a way, she's not in the action, but she's always photographing it and being aware of it and kind of coming to the action. Um, you know, so I think it's kind of an interesting thing. So, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit about um, women and photographers and um, was that kind of a common thing in Victorian England at this time? No, it really wasn't. Um, there, there were some photographers who were women, but I, I don't think they reached any great amount of renown during that period. It was later during the 20th century. But um, I, always, I always try to write about outliers in my work. Like I, I don't want to write about the typical person. Like Sano in my Japanese series is not a typical samurai. He's, he's an outlier. He has a mind of his own. And he does things that conventional people don't do. And Sarah is really a sano in a in a corset and a bustle, <laughs> if you want to <laughs> if you want to put it that way. You know, he's she's got a lot of his characteristics, and I, I really think those are characteristics of the, the classic um, detective. You know, Sherlock Holmes, very unconventional. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's a whole tradition of that. So I, I don't depart from that at all. It's just a matter of finding. The, the oddities in the period I'm writing in and in my character that make it possible for them to do the things they want to do while still staying in character with their own period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So speaking of oddities, the dead man in Portrait of Peril is a death photographer. Um, we don't have those now. And I was wondering, could you share, you know, for our listeners a little bit about what death photography is and what, what the ideas were behind it? Well, in the Victorian period, um, some people believe that although ghosts are not visible to the human eye, the camera can capture their images on film or on uh, glass plates as they were at the time. And um, so what you would do is you would set up a camera in a place that you thought was haunted and you would take a bunch of pictures. Um, sometimes you would do long exposures because it was usually dark. Well, night in the graveyard, it's dark, and uh, you know there wasn't electric lighting back then, so you know very dim. And then um, you would develop the plate and hope that a ghost showed up. 
Now, of course, mm-hmm. there was a lot of fakery. They, they knew about double exposures, you know, printing multiple exposures, even back then, you know, it's like as soon as one invention crops up, people think of a whole bunch of variations that, uh, I mean, maybe pranks would be a way to call it. But mm-hmm. um, some people took this very seriously. So the, um, the victim in Portrait of Peril is one of these ghost photographers and he dies in a haunted church where incidentally, Sarah happens to be getting married and his, um, his body crops up during the ceremony. And um, on one of his cameras is an image that looks like him being assaulted by a ghost. So, oh no, he was murdered by a ghost. You know, there's ghosts on the rampage. And um, this, was, this was a very serious belief that I don't think has quite gone away because um, there's this um, series of ghost stuff that my husband likes to watch on cable TV. And he, could, he just watches hours and hours of the stuff. And it's all about ghost hunters and paranormal. And um, some of these special effects don't look any more convincing than the ones in the Victorian ghost photos, but uh, there's still a lot of interest in this. And if you look online, there's a lot of uh, YouTube videos about how to take your own ghost photos and how to fake it if the spirits aren't showing up. Well, yeah, and I think that sort of the same way we're fascinated by ufos and by by any of the sort of marginal you know uncanny uh kind of one foot in the real world one foot kind of maybe out of the real world sort of thing um and i think um if i remember correctly mesmerism was still a thing sort of at mid-century maybe not so much in the 1890s but um there were seances and um i know that um I think it was, was this, maybe it was Scotland Yard. I don't remember whether it was Scotland Yard or one of the other detectives, but the, there was a famous case about these two women who were duping all kinds of people. And they actually went from England. Um, and when it started getting a little bit too hot for them in England, they popped over to New York and redid the whole entire thing over there under different names. So there, and, and it was one of those cases where American actually, and Europe had, and England had to actually cooperate and figure out who these women were. Um, but I think they made off with, you know, hundreds of people's, you know, hundreds of pounds of people's money. Was that, so, was that the Fox sisters? Yeah, there was Fox sisters. And yeah, then there the was Fox another, sisters. another pair too, but the Fox sisters, I think they were the famous ones. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. actually there's, there's a whole town in New York that has a lot of mediums and people who run seances. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lily Dale. I, I've been mm-hmm. meaning to go yeah. up there and have a look at it. Yeah. But yeah, that, that, uh, that's beliefs that, that never die. And I, yeah. I think the, the fascination is just going to persist because, you know, we always know there's, there's more to the universe than we can see. And well, maybe mm-hmm. it does include murderous ghosts. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it makes, it makes for good. Um, it makes for something good to sort of like, I don't know, poke at with, with fiction at least. So yeah. Um, there was a, I'm trying to think which one it was. I think it's season in, I don't know if you've seen, I think I asked you if you had seen the new masterpiece, Miss Scarlet and the Duke. It has uh, six episodes so far. And the fourth one has a, uh, something got like the death photographer in it. So, and that one's set in like 1880s, I think. So yeah, I, I can't wait to see that one. Yeah. Actually, I, when I was doing research, um, Harry Houdini, of all people, was a big ghost debunker. So he um, he had a, a photograph of himself taken with the, the ghost of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> That's but funny. I, I think people, even though he tried to explain how it was done, some people probably did think that, oh, that's uh, that's Abe and Harry. Well, I mean, <laughs> I told you it was possible. <laughs> Well, for some people, I think it was probably reassuring, you know, the idea that, you know, they're, um, you know, somebody that they love who's dead is watching out for them, or at least still with them in some way. Um, I can understand how that would mitigate grief. Yeah, and I, there was there was so much grief during the Victorian period, because mm-hmm. death was so ever present, you know, we, we forget in this day and age, I mean, we, we have a pandemic now, but they, they had all kinds of epidemics all the time. Like um, in my, my latest book is set in 1890 and um, they're, uh, I guess they're, they're getting into a flu epidemic, you know, right, right about then. 
Yeah. And um, actually, Queen Victoria's grandson, among other people, died during this this epidemic. But you know, it's just all kinds of cholera and typhoid yep. and yep. tuberculosis. Oh my! Mm-hmm. Like remember all the the you know. Oh yeah. Also, the Bronte family died of tuberculosis. Yep. Mm-hmm. So death death was just uh, constantly dogging their heels. So I, I mm-hmm. think it must have been comforting to to think that those people were still with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we need need a little of that comfort ourselves. Yeah. 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 They also had a practice of, um, and in fact, when I first read that this was about death photography, they uh, there was a practice of, for example, if your child died in childbirth, that you would dress it up and make it look alive and then take a photograph of it as if it were still alive in order to have a memory. Of that. Yeah, no, what's, uh, what's really sad is um, photography was relatively expensive during the period, and for a lot of people, that was the only photograph they had of their child. You know, they didn't manage to get the money when the child was healthy and, and alive, but mm-hmm. they managed to scrape it up after the child was dead, maybe a family collection or something. Yeah. And um, you know, so it, it is. It is very sad. But yeah, yeah, not only children, but they would prop up adults. You mm-hmm. know, anybody of any age that died, and they wanted a picture. Yeah, yeah. I know that's really that's sort of yeah. painful. Think about but that. I, I yeah. guess we, you know, we still do that nowadays as people take photographs of their their loved ones and the mm-hmm. coffin. And you know, I, I think it is a measure of comfort. Yeah. So. Um, what what uh, what do you think is um, I, I, I found it, I, I guess one of the things I found very interesting about this book is the idea that there were um, there could be you know a presence ghosts from beyond death and you know maybe hauntings as it were but the other thing that seemed to really come out in this book um, that seems somewhat related is how experiences from our past can haunt us. So not just people who have passed away, but experiences from our past can haunt us and how parents can, um, you know, what parents owe their children and what children owe their parents as a result of some of these experiences. Um, There seems to be a lot of of kind of woven in, very, you know, feathered in very nicely, um, a theme about what family members owe each other as far as loyalty and that kind of thing. Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, that's that's interesting you bring that up because uh, loyalty was such a big part of the Samurai Code of Honor. And I think that that runs through cultural groups and family groups of all nations and and all times. You know, loyalty is very important because uh, if, if you can't count on your friends and family, you're, you're just kind of lost out there by yourself. And so, that, you know, that is a, a very important uh, attribute of, of all cultures everywhere, I think. Mm-hmm. But um, as, a, as an ongoing plot line in my series, uh, there's a mystery in Sarah's family past. Uh, her father disappeared when she was 10 and she doesn't find out until the series begins um, 20 years later that he was a suspect in a murder and he was, uh, you know, he was on the run from the law all these years. Um, her mother mm-hmm. told her that she was, he was dead, and she believed that. Well, not quite believing it, or not quite wanting to believe it. Mm-hmm. And um, then there's a, a lot of, a lot of uh, question about, well, what do you owe to a father who is a murderer if you believe he's a murderer? <laughs> Um, are you still loyal to that person, even though he's supposedly done a terrible thing? Mm-hmm. And are you loyal to the mother who lied to you about all this stuff that happened in the past and just you know, it's just swept everything under the rug? No explanation for anything. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, that makes for a very good mystery series where uh, the character finds out along with the reader what's really going on and uh, what happens as a result. But you know, I think people really are haunted by the past. I mean, doesn't everybody still think about things that happen in high school? <laughs> do we ever mm-hmm. really leave high school behind? Um, do we ever really leave our childhood behind, especially if it's traumatic or mm-hmm. maybe if it's really happy? You don't want to mm-hmm. leave entirely behind. 
you know, I, yeah. I think maybe that explains the the uh, craze for so many uh, Twilight Zone marathons over the holidays is, um, you know, that really takes you back to those days when you really had nothing to do but worry about uh, catching the next Twilight Zone episode because there were no VCRs. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And I know that when my daughter comes home from college or when she's under any kind of stress and what I needing to sort of you know de-stress she uh jumps back and reads things like the Narnia series or the Harry Potter series and you know there, there's a certain comfort in that old familiar you know aspect um but on the other hand I will freely admit that um I do remember some things from my high school I mean I'm 55 now so that's what 30 that's 40 years ago and I I'm going to admit this for the first time. I've never told anybody this. I named some of my villains after people who were mean to me in high school. Oh, that's that's a good one. <laughs> that, that really works. <laughs> it does. It makes me feel good. Oh, you know what else? What else is good is uh, I belong to this um, Facebook group of uh, alumni from my high school who have died. Mm -hmm. So I, I get to see everybody I outlived. Yeah, there's a certain triumph in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, uh, okay. Well, they, they did better than I did back then, but I'm still here. It's <laughs> <laughs> bad. I know. Okay, so my, my nephew for my for Christmas, I don't know if you can see this mug, but it says, please do not annoy the writer. She may put you in a book and kill her. Oh, this yeah. Is, this is yeah, the mug that definitely. I keep. Yeah. So, so we're all, you know we're all sort of working out through our demons. But, you know, it, and, and Sarah's got, she has not only the demons that, you know, her, her father, who presents a really troubling backstory, um, and also the mother, who is another troubling backstory. I mean, she's dead, but she still, you know, has, has you know, is casting her shadow over Sarah. But Sarah has a half-sister named Sally. And I thought it was interesting that you chose that name because sometimes Sally can be a nickname for Sarah. And um, I was wondering what you could say, I, I'm always fascinated by doubles in books, um, you know, either doppelgangers or, or people who are kind of paired in a way. Um, do you anticipate, and in, and in this book, the two sisters come together. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about their partnership. Well, it's a very interesting relationship because neither of them knew that the other existed until they were already adults mm -hmm. because um, Sally is the daughter that Sarah's father had after he disappeared on Sarah and her mother. Well, supposedly disappeared without a trace, but actually was running away from a murder charge. But um, he does the same thing to Sally and her mother. So they both have this disappeared father in their background. And that's, that's kind of a bond between them. And also, um, Sarah is kind of a prickly person who was ready to just hate Sally because she's the daughter that took her place in her father's life. But Sally is a really nice, sweet person that's, that's hard to resist. And I think they, they are two sides of a coin. Like here's this, uh, this dark, prickly sister and the, the sweet, light, nice one that are, are, are grappling with the same issue of, uh, of the disappeared parent from their childhood and what he's been up to that caused them to disappear and having, having to face some, some nasty truths about, about their families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that's, um, I, I found that a really compelling subplot, watching those two sort of work around each other and try and figure out how you feel about dad. Well, how do you feel about our father? And, and you know, try to try to work together to both protect him, but at the same time, start working to excavate the truth. So, yeah, and I, yeah. well, the the big uh, the big question aside from who done it and the major mystery that goes on in every novel <laughs> is 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 Dad guilty or innocent? Did he or didn't he? So, actually, I'm I'm uh, solving that mystery in the book that I'm writing now that will come out next year if I finish mm -hmm. writing it. <laughs> so uh, that that part of it will be be solved because I, I thought that I really needed to wind that up. You, you can't uh, can't carry that on for very many books, certainly not mm -hmm. eight for a series. So you know, I, I promise there is an end to that mystery in sight. Yeah, well, and you kind of hinted that because that appears in the epilogue where dad is, 
is you know sort of brought yeah forth he's, he's on the brink he's gonna exactly. he's gonna face his reckoning <laughs> yeah 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 so um what tell what is, can you tell us a little bit about what your next book is about in the series well the next book is um i, I have this fascination with carnivals and and circuses you know, I don't know if it had to do with my first trip to a freak show when I must have been about 10 years old and uh, we were at the state fair in Michigan and, oh, there's the freak show, we have to go. And my parents are, oh, all right, you know, we, we don't know what's in there. So, you know, it was, it was really fascinating. Um, nowadays, it would be just terribly, just terribly offensive and I, I don't even know if they do that anymore. You know, but back back then, like in the fifties and sixties, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, they they really, you know, they called it the freak show, and they had, um, I guess, what they would call human oddities, and that, you know, that's definitely a long tradition, I guess, as far, probably as far back as humanity, and then the the Spanish court, court dwarves, and um, you know, the the Victorian museums of curiosity. So um, this is this is the setting for my next book is one of these places that's kind of a combination carnival and museum of oddities, where there are some very strange people. Strange not in terms of physical aspects, but they, they have their own dark secrets and um, the, the murder has its roots in, in their past. Interesting. How do you do your research for your books? What is sort of your, when you, when you come up with, I don't know whether this is how you work. I kind of usually something peculiar happens and then something else peculiar happens. I put them together and then think, oh, okay, well that's the beginning of something. And then I start researching. So how, how does your, how does your process work and how do you do your research? I tend to pick up on um, historical facts that intrigue me. Like um, for The Hangman's Secret, which is, um, I guess that's book number three, I, I got very interested in England's history of capital punishment. Um, they were still doing public executions till um, I think it was maybe 1868, maybe you remember better than I do. Yeah. And they didn't stop doing hangings until 1968. So, you know, they, they have a long tradition. Um, hangmen are historical figures. And hanging is an, is an actual art and science that um, you, you have to be able to do it right or else it gets really messy. So, you know, the crime in that story is, um, you know, a very messy hanging that turns out to be a murder. So, yeah, you know, there's, there's always some aspect of, of history, like with the, the carnivals and the museums, um, mm -hmm. photography, definitely. And then things things kind of spiral out of control after that. But mm -hmm. um, I, I find that as a series goes on, it also becomes more character driven because you have these set of characters that you established and then you have to come up with something that they could do that's in line with, with their skills and their personalities. Like I, you know, I really can't see Sarah becoming like a, a international spy or something, you know, that, that's just, <laughs> Uh, within her within her purview or her friends um, they're they're very much of their of their time and place and uh, location so um it, it goes back and forth between characters and history it, it's always that intertwining mm -hmm. i tend to yeah. lean somewhat heavily on newspapers and um certainly like books there's a there's a wonderful book that i reread pretty much before every every uh book that I start writing, The Ascent of the Detective. And it's um, it's covers the evolution of the detective from the Bow Street Runners in the early 1800s, all the way up through the development of, you know, the Scotland Yard and the CID, and then some of the, um, you know, some of the specialized branches and that kind of thing. Because um, I, find, I find those really useful. I also love to go back to things like Wilkie Collins and Anthony Trollope and even some Dickens. Um, uh, some of those sensation novelists like Mrs. Henry Wood and reread some of their things because there's so much uh, just detail and sort of like the daily life and even the cadence of their speech. Um, I find that really helpful to go back to. Do you have a favorite um, place you like to go or? Well, I, I like historic crimes. Um, there's, mm -hmm. there's a good series on um, 
YouTube. It's called Lady Killers, and it's about okay. um, female killers throughout England's history. And some of them are from the Victorian period. Um, I think I think there's one about the uh, the um, baby butcher who features okay, yeah. in uh, my novel, The Hangman's Secret, who uh, murdered mm -hmm. something like 400 babies. They, they don't even know for sure. And I, I think England really has a lack on serial killers. You know, they, they do it like <laughs> nobody else does. So <laughs> his, historic crime is really fascinating and you can get a lot of the, the legal details and the, you know, the forensic details and things from just accounts of true crime. Mm -hmm. I see Patrick's back with us. Yeah, hi Patrick. Uh, hey, how are you guys? Uh, I'm just uh, I have a couple of questions that have come through, but um, you know, it strikes me that that period that you're writing about um, is 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 so fascinating in all these different levels. You know, you have these new strides in um, you know anatomy and uh, you know body snatchers and all these different kind of trends going on at that time, and then a little bit later at the, towards the turn of the century is that fascinating spiritualist kind of movement, you know, in that whole period, uh, just all kinds of different threads coming together. Um, I have a, a, somebody named Maria or Mariah, I, I think, is asking a question for both of you, which is, um, are there decades in the 20th century uh, that particularly, particularly intrigue you in the 20th century? Well, I, I kind of like the 1950s, and um, this is uh, partly because that's when I was born and I was too young to know what was going on, and now I'm finding out. And another reason is that um, I'm very interested in Sylvia Plath, the poet, who was a young woman during that era, and that led me to an interest in um, mental hospitals and the, the whole horrible story of um, psychiatric treatment in its infancy, which um, this is as gory as the Victorians, no, no doubt about it. Like the, the drive-by lobotomies and all that, that's, that's really fascinating. So yeah, the 1950s were not as bland and placid as they seemed. How about you, Karen? I'm gonna be boring and say, I'm not really interested in the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> I, I lived through part of it. Um, I, I think I, I am so firmly planted in the 1870s and every single time I think, oh, maybe there's not really all that much more. I, I find some other weird, quirky fact that, that kind of just anchors me right there. So, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, it's one of those things that the more research you do into something, the more fascinated you are by it. And um, Laura Joe's, you know, I think that she's more be me more comfortable jumping. I mean, she jumped from Japan all the way to Victorian England. So 1950s might not be much of a stretch, but I'm probably just kind of stuck in the 1870s myself. <laughs> um, this is more of a comment. There's a viewer that kind of circling back to the, the uh, photography that you're talking about, the, the death photography, uh, funeral photography. Um, someone named Brenda uh, at, says, mentioned the fact that they're they have a, uh, a staff photographer at the Mayo Clinic whose uh, chief duty, I think, is, uh, no, she says the Mayo Clinic has photographers on call that go in to take photos for newborns who have died. Did you all know that? I thought that was fascinating. I didn't. Wow. Very interesting. Huh. Yeah. Well, and also you were talking a little bit about, about you know, death photography. And I was thinking about in the old West, you know, the frontier West, you know, the gunfighters would routinely photograph, you know, dead, you know, villains or uh, outlaws uh, and prop them up in caskets and things like that. Um, well, the samurai used to just take the victim's head and um, bring it to the boss. They didn't have cameras back then. If they yeah, had, they might, yeah. it might have been a little different. <laughs> Well, then the, the, the cartels, of course, in recent years have, you know, been very theatrical in, in what they're doing as well. It's pretty right. hor yeah. horrifying. Um, Laura, have you, have you touched, I don't think, upon your, um, your Charlotte Bronte books at all? And can you talk a little bit about what interested you about, I mean, the Brontes themselves are so interesting, you know, the Branwell and, and everybody. Can you talk a little bit about what drew you to Charlotte? 
Yeah, I have a, uh, well, I guess it's sort of a series. It's two books about um, Charlotte Bronte as a, uh, as a suspense heroine. And um, of course, the fascination of the Brontes, those, those poor girls out on the, out on the moors and um, they've just a uh, very, uh, very sad, tragic life dying one by one. But um, I wanted, I wanted to give Charlotte the life that I thought that she would have wanted at least in some form. Um, she was a very adventurous person who I, I think was uh, was disappointed in her life in a lot of ways because although she became a notorious best-selling author, you know, she, she had a history of unrequited love with, with men who probably didn't even know that she cared for them um, and her family was dying and she was a, a very shy, retiring person. And she lived a, a very circumscribed life, even for a, a Victorian writer. There, there were women writers of that era who lived much bigger, more public lives. And you know, she was just not up to that either physically or emotionally. So I, I wanted to give her an adventure. So I gave her two um, starring roles in uh, international spy thrillers. How cool is that? Well, I don't know if she would thank me for it if, if she knew, but <laughs> she Did might they, be shocked at some of the things I made her do. Were they published under their own names in their lifetime or was it? Oh, yeah, they, they were. Yeah. They were. Okay. So I think, wasn't there Quentin and Acton Bell and they had male her, suit? Oh, birth. well, not, not, on, not under their own names, but they, you know, they were published in their own name, well, in their own life. And then Charlotte was the one that came out. You know, because there was a lot of um, a lot of controversy about who is this writer, you know, this Kerr or Bell, and they were saying all kinds of things about her, and I guess blaming the books on the other Bells. So she finally came out. So um, people people actually knew who she was before she died. Not not so Emily and Anne. I think they they managed to die before the um, you know the proverbial substance hit the fan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, some of your interests in the, in the, the macabre and the, uh, I find fascinating too. I have an interest in, you know, the, the carnivals and um, is there anything else you can kind of give us a hint about your work in progress and about the carnival? Well, it, it has a dwarf, a woman with a tail and a, a tattooed man. And I, I have to confess, I thank Ray Bradbury for the, the illustrated man. <laughs> you know, these, these influences crop up all over the place. There was a, a, a wonderful, um, you probably saw it, a B film noir called Nightmare Alley that was made out of a terrific, uh, terrific novel um, called Nightmare Alley by William Lindsay Gresham. Are you familiar with that book? Um, I haven't heard of that one. I'm going to have to look it up. But oh. uh, have you have you seen the the old I think German movie Freaks? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that that was that's an astounding movie. We accept you. We accept you. One of us. Yeah, no. yeah. Well, now now that we've uh, carved you up into little pieces, yeah, you're one of us now. Right. <laughs> right. Which for trivia buffs is where the the Ramones got their their little shtick was from that movie, The Freaks. Um, although we di digress. Uh, Karen, what can you tell us about, about what you have coming next? Can you tell us much? Sure. Yeah, I can, I can tell you. Um, the, book is, the book is written and it's, it's been um, accepted for publication, although the contract is not in my hands yet, so I'm not saying anything more about it. But this is about, um, so I'm doing the exact opposite of what Laura Jo did. I am jumping to a male protagonist. Um, this is a inspector at Scotland Yard in 1878. His name is Mickey Corvin. And he grew up uh, a bare knuckles boxer in Whitechapel and a dock worker. And so when he has, to, he, he, he is asked to um, throw a match and he refuses. Um, and as a result, the owner of the um, boxing establishment basically throws him out of Whitechapel and tells him not to come back. So he decides he's going to go off to Lambeth and be a policeman. So that's where he starts. And when we meet him some years later, he's about 30 years old and he's at Scotland Yard. And he is, um, he's confront, he's, he's 
haunted because his mother vanished when he was 11 and no one ever found out what happened to her. So missing, missing persons cases claw at him worse than murders um, because he can imagine the worst thing happening to them. So he has two cases going. One of them is a missing persons and one of them um, as of the first day of the book is a young woman who's found dead in a boat floating down the Thames. And it turns out that she's a daughter of a very prominent wealthy judge and he is asked to uh, solve that case. And part of the difficulty um, and part of the, I guess, pleasure of writing this book was when I found out what Lord Joe calls kind of like the, the funny historical fact that in, the 18, in 1877, Scotland Yard was, was nearly disbanded. Three of its senior inspectors were all found guilty of um, fraud and steering the police away from certain criminals and being paid to do so. There's something like 30,000 pounds changed hands. I mean, it was, it was a big deal. And these three people ended up going to jail and they ended up, um, I, think being, I, think, I think that combined, they were all senior inspectors and I think combined they had something like 70 years worth of experience. So who knows what else they had been doing during their time at Scotland Yard, right? So there was a commission um, appointed by parliament, um, house cleaned, people kicked out. Um, they, had, they appointed um, a, a young man named Howard Vincent who had actually previously been a newspaper reporter to be the new director for the Scotland Yard. They reorganized it. And there was still a commission that wanted to um, take Scotland Yard out altogether. They just didn't feel that they could be trusted. Plain clothes meant you could get away with anything. So they did not want plain clothes men. So this is the context within which Corvin is now having to, because the, the trial was held at the Old Bailey and there were mobs of people screaming things about how terrible the yard was and how they all deserved to be hanged and thrown in the Thames and all that kind of stuff. And this is the situation in which Corvin finds himself having to solve a murder case. So it's, it's just it's it's just a great time period. The 1870s is just a great time period for this kind of stuff. But that sounds where, like that's a, sounds again. like the the honorable man in a in a corrupt world. Yeah, that's that's yeah. a very a little we, bit. We don't change yeah. much, do we? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> that sounds terrific, uh, Karen. So now I'm assuming yeah, I'm that's the first of, that's the first in the new series. I'm assuming it is. It yep. is, yeah. So that one's written, and then the next one up, up the, I think sort of my, I think sort of my hook. I'm fascinated by the Thames, and I actually just got um, two really wonderful books. One's called Mudlark, about a woman who is still a mudlark. She still goes to down to the Thames and hunts things, and she finds all kinds of really cool stuff. And this the book was written, I think maybe ten years ago. And then the other one is called The Thames, and it's um, a big fat book all about the history of the Thames. Um, but I'm fascinated by the river. I, it's kind of the, 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 the aorta of the city, but it's also its cesspool. Everything ends up in there. And the, one of the things that happened in 1878 that was kind of interesting was the Princess Alice disaster. Um, I don't know if you know anything about it, but it's, it's, it's not quite the Titanic, but it happened right there in the center of London and 600 people went down with the ship. So, um, and the thing is, it was one of those fun ships where you could kind of hop on, ride for a while, get off, have dinner, hop back on. And so there was no manifest. Nobody knows who died. They know who survived it because, you know, they came out and they printed lists of survivors in the newspaper, but nobody knew who, who all died in that. Um, one, so of Jack kind of the Ripper's, um, one of Jack the Ripper's victims would always go around claiming that her husband and child had died in that disaster and disaster, yeah. nobody nobody knew if it was true or not. Right. Yep. They didn't know. So it's kind of a, it's, a, it's another one of those wonderful little moments. Um, it's kind of like the Pantechnicon and the Trace of Deceit. It went up in flames and nobody <sighs> knows exactly what was in that enormous warehouse full of paintings and sculpture and jewelry and banknotes and all kinds of other things. Because a lot of times people would, you know, take a, take a, um, for example, one of the famous things was they had a bed, uh, a huge bed frame and someone had car they carved a secret um, cabinet inside it where they could store valuable things so that they would, they, that the stuff would be safe, but they wouldn't have to pay the insurance on it. 
So nobody really knew what was lost in the Pantechnicon fire and what wasn't. Same kind of mystery. I like that. Wow, that's really yeah. cool. Now, do, do both of you, um, uh, I'm sure you, before the, before the pandemic, um, enjoy doing research trips to, to England? I mean, who wouldn't? And do you find inspiration in, you know, kind of walking the streets of London and, and you know, going on site as it were? I don't travel a whole lot. Um, a lot of my research comes from, uh, well, old books and old pictures and uh, a lot of online research. And uh, one thing about the Victorian period as opposed to medieval Japan is there is a whole wealth of information available. You know, 17th century Japan was difficult, especially pre-internet, but uh, this, is, uh, this is almost too rich. I, I can get lost in research so easily and I just have to tell myself enough, quit. <laughs> yeah, it can become a rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, I, I did take some trips to London when I was in graduate school. I spent about six weeks in London researching railway disasters, which was for my dissertation, but which eventually became the fodder for my first book, Lady in the Smoke, with a young woman who's in a railway crash in 1874 with her mother. And then later, before I wrote, as I was writing Dangerous Duet, which is set in a music hall, I went, my husband had a business trip and I went with him, which is always a really nice way to travel. And I found the last Victorian music hall from the 1850s, Wilton's, which is in um, uh, in Grace's Lane, kind of near where the Ripper murders happened um, in Whitechapel. And I walked in and it, it was sort of amazing. You walk in and, and there's the, the, the floors are sort of saggy and dark. And you can tell they've had a lot of beer spilled on them. And you can walk down the stairs into the basement. Um, you can walk up and see the music hall itself, which is really beautiful and is still used. They still put shows on there. So to be able to be actually in the physical space, which I think is something you can do in, for Victorian London, or you can at least approximate it in a way you cannot do in 17th Japan. I mean, there's even if you were to go to Japan, I'm not sure how much you could really kind of get yourself into the place that it was. Yeah, so. that's, that's kind of hard because, um, well, Japan is very modern and the places that are traditional are, I guess, kind of museum-like. You know, they, they don't have the, um, I guess, I don't know, you'd call it the, uh, the historic squalor or whatever. You know, yeah. it's, it's not like that at all. Yeah. But um, when, when, I, when travel restrictions do loosen up, I, I want to go to England and see uh, two particular things. One is the Welcome Museum, which is a, a medical museum yeah. of oddities. And then another thing, uh, this relates to what Karen was saying about the river. They, they have Thames at low tide tours where they, they put you in boots and give you a stick and you, know, you go poking around on the riverbed while they tell you the history and everybody's just covered in mud, but it, it looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> I'll go with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, let's see if there are any more questions. I don't really see anything. A lot of people watching and, and just saying how much they enjoy your books. Um, so I'd like to thank you both very much for spending, spending this hour with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank yeah. Thank you. And, and uh, hopefully we'll see, well, I know we'll see Karen probably before we'll see you, Laura, but it would be great to see you back out here in the desert at some point. Oh, I would love it. Yeah. Well, um, Thanks again, and you guys both have a have a wonderful evening and a great Thanks. weekend. Hey, Patrick, can I talk to you for one second after we get off? Sure, absolutely. After we close off? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Bye, Laura. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.